Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew Howie, uh, Director of eLearning WMV. I'm uh, going to be talking about blended learning this afternoon, and uh, the title of the, of the session is called It's, it's Time to Face the Facts. Um, I've, I've run a session or variations of this session over the last sort of three or four years at different events um, uh, around, around the UK. Um, and before the question really was um, if or how, you know, should we have blended model models moving forward? Do they work? Do they not? Uh, you know, examples of good models and things like that. Uh, but obviously, since the pandemic and uh, things coming out from a sort of global perspective, um, I, you know, I personally believe and we personally believe that that, that question is now kind of not really relevant um, as whether it's if or how. It's, it's literally how we're going to blend moving forward. Uh, moving into the next sort of three, four, five years and beyond. Um, and so that's what we're going to be covering a little bit today. Feel free to answer any uh, or ask any questions, um, and I'll try and cover them at the end if we've got time. There's a lot to cover, so I'm just going to go straight forward. Okay. So <clears throat> essentially, uh, the current state of play um, is COVID, as we're all aware, uh, resulted in around about 1.4 billion learners affected worldwide. And I would suggest that that's probably gone up since this research was done. Um, we, we're all aware of how that happened, you know, in terms of institutions being closed, people not being able to see, and obviously it affected delivery and learning models around the globe. So we've seen a distinct rise in online learning, um, and really the education landscape has been changed dramatically. Um, and the research at the moment is suggesting that the online learning, certainly during COVID, has shown to increase retention of information, take less time, and <clears throat> This, along with other things and other benefits, which we'll cover later, is meaning really that the changes around blended learning or certainly digital learning and online learning are here to stay. <coughs> I can't see that changing um, anytime soon. Now, even before COVID, there was already a high growth and adoption in education technology. So roughly around 2019, we were looking globally around about 13 and a half billion pounds spent in education technology. That projection before COVID was uh, estimated to reach around 250 billion by 2025. I would suggest that that is going to be even more uh, now based on what's happened since COVID um, and the impact it's had on the educational landscape, not just globally, but nationally and locally as well. So the emphasis now on increasing the levels and uptake of online learning is now seen at global level. I mean, I don't know if anybody uh, was on the online World Economic Forum conference in February. Um, certainly it was touched upon there. And if you look at some of the global policies coming out now from uh, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations, it's talking very much around online learning and how online learning can help reduce poverty gaps. So there's going to be lots of investment in that area, which I think will obviously have a trickle down effect across global, national, local levels. So improving education uh, is, but obviously will require a huge shift. OK, so it's not obviously merely transferring courses online. Um, you know, it's a transforming teaching, learning, assessment and cultural elements within our organisations. So it's happening right now. Um, you know, UK educators must now have the ability to provide quality remote education in line with government guidance. Obviously, the government emphasis that education is not optional. And so if we're to have any other incidents where institutions and organisations have to close uh, or any further lockdowns, I think now really the emphasis is that we should be, be prepared to be able to offer education to everybody at any time, anywhere. So the future now is likely to be a hybrid learning environment. So a combination of in-person and online teaching. So organisations have to look to technologies that will continue to stay relevant as learning needs evolve. Blended learning models are here to stay. Um, we can talk about, we will talk about the sort of benefits and obviously the negatives sometimes of blended learning. Um, it's not obviously that, okay, great. We've got an online course, that's it. Now everybody's happy. Of course not. You know, the, the importance of face-to-face uh, teaching and training is still vitally important, but I think it's just we have to really now adopt a much more blended approach. So the paradigm shift is here, and if we ignore it, technology will find a route to market anyway, um, and it is finding a route to market anyway. And if we embrace it, we can harness this constructively to enhance face-to-face -face learning. What we can't allow is just, and I know this doesn't apply to anybody on this 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 meeting, but you know, unscrupulous train providers or unscrupulous provision not being, you know harnessing technology in the wrong way. 
and, um, and that's why we need to work together to ensure this doesn't happen. Um, right now, EdTech is in its infancy, uh, and, and it, the possibilities though are large and huge, and we're all, we are on the brink of an explosion of innovation in the space, and it's crucial that as a sector that we're working together as, as educators to channel it responsibly and to ensure that we're, we're working towards the same goals um, and working together to achieve those. Now, obviously, with all these things, and certainly, you know, the biggest shift, I think, is around cultural change. And I just want to mention a few things around cultural change. Um, online learning requires discipline. We know that. The reality is that it's going to, to favour a certain type of learner over ones that are trying to find their bearings on their own timetable. So we know that education requires discipline, um, but online learning has less handholding. And so we have to be careful, I suppose, in terms of how we structure some of our courses to ensure that every learner moves forward. Now, learning will be digitized. You know, paper can be comforting, as are textbooks. But generally speaking, I think the general idea from a global perspective is that both of these are going to be going away. Um, and this process change means that organizations have to go digital and they're going to have to change styles. I appreciate many organizations have already done this or have started to do this, but it is happening and we have to just accept that now. What we've also seen from a sort of policy perspective is that there's these kind of terms around um, facilitators of learning. So organizations are going to be bringing a new generation of instructors called facilitators of learning. You're probably going to see this term talked about a lot over the next few years, rather than teachers of knowledge or um, or just you know teachers or trainers of knowledge. We're looking at the process of learning and how best we can facilitate that process for every learner. Now, that means that we're going to need staff with more adaptable skill sets. You can't just be, say, for example, an assessor. You know, there has to be now, I believe, really a, a flexibility to take on uh, dual or even triple roles within your role um, to, to, be, to, to make yourselves relevant, really, to the marketplace. Analytics are going to become more prevalent. So analytics, being able to drill down into learning data, into learners' data, in terms of how they're learning, how they're progressing, where the skills gaps are, where the gaps of knowledge are, and using that to inform your processes of delivery are just going to become even more and more important. Um, they can definitely be a benefit when used effectively. Um, and obviously, when not used effectively, when you're sitting on a barrage of data, it, it's, it can be a bit of a hindrance. But this is why it's important. And you know, we will see more and more of this over the next few years. The biggest concern, though, I believe, really will be around the digital divide. Um, all you need to do is really talk to two different train providers or colleges to see the digital divide at work. I mean, you know, some learners don't have access to devices. You know, some learners don't have broadband. Some learners lack structures at home. Some staff lack structure at home. Um, so the digital divide will appear at every level of education, whether it's simple as, you know, something as simple as needing a webcam or something more severe like internet access and a computer. But this isn't new. It's definitely been magnified by the COVID pandemic. Um, and it's not just the learners who are affected. You know, in some cases, delivery staff at train providers and colleges have found the transition difficult to adapt to too. You know, literally being asked to switch from face-to-face -face delivery to a digital or online learning uh, and just working with technology that they've never used before has provided and produced a lot of problems for a number of providers. It's not just quick clicks. Um, but, you know, this is something we're all going to have to sort of adapt and get used to. So we'll just quickly touch upon some of the definitions around blended learning. There are multiple. I mean, generally speaking, though, that, you know, there's a general kind of consensus of thought around what blended learning is now. The dictionary definition there is right in front of you. Fairly simple style of education which students learn via electronic and online media, as well as traditional face to face teaching. However, it can describe a teaching style that combines the use of technology and online exercises or materials to assist in the classroom, whilst having a traditional hands-on and in-person lesson as well. It's talking about the integration online with traditional face-to-face -face class activities in a planned, pedagogically valuable manner. It's the effective combination of different modes of delivery, models of teaching and styles of learning. And it involves the combination of two fields of concern, education and education technology. Now, the concept of blended learning really cannot be defined precisely. You can look and you can research this and you'll see lots of different scholars talking about it in different ways. But generally speaking, and it's generally agreed upon that blended learning is an integrated learning experience that is controlled and guided 
by the instructor or trainer, whether in the form of face-to-face -face communication or their virtual presence. So those are just some general <coughs> ideas around blended, blended learning, what the concept of blended learning is. Now, in terms of sort of models of blended learning, there are quite a few uh, out there at the moment in terms of what are being used um, by different organisations, both from um, uh, university educational, uh, higher educational backgrounds, but also all the trickle down the way down to primary school. Um, but here, really, I'm just going to touch on about four of them that you'll find if you look into this and some of you will know this already, there's, there's more than four. But I'm just going to touch on four. Um, but uh, it's not proven that one method shows the best results yet. It is very much a mix and match. Uh, one of them is called the rotation model. And this is where learners rotate between working online and other classroom based modalities. So it really is just that, that kind of moving around from an online module straight across to perhaps back to the school environment, bricks and mortar setting. We've got something now called the flex model. We've seen this uh, definitely uh, have an uptake during COVID. So this is where the, the learners study mainly online according to individually customized schedules with face-to-face -face, uh, support provided by the tutor trainer as needed. But that face-to-face -face support now is definitely coming more along the lines of the kind of team Zoom element uh, in terms of supporting the learners online. So the flex model is definitely something now which we're seeing a lot more of. The self-blend model, um, which learners supplement their traditional studies by taking an additional online course. Uh, haven't seen much of this, obviously, during COVID, but uh, that was definitely something pre-COVID where um, we saw, you know, a lot of learners perhaps sort of going in for face-to-face -face sessions or face-to-face -face workshops uh, physically, and then perhaps taking uh, elements of it or an online element of it uh, just online. And the enriched virtual model in which learning is mainly online with occasional visits to a brick and mortar setting for face-to-face -face tuition. So uh, this may become more popular, I think, uh, post-pandemic. I think more organisations and institutions are looking at this in a little bit more detail around this particular model. Um, and will, you know, for, for obvious reasons, really just being a little bit more flexible in how they can deliver their, their, their learning solutions. OK, let's just touch uh, touch upon at the moment just some of the some of the difficulties um, with blended learning. Um, and this is things that we've come across as well. I've come across over the last few years um, and what I've seen happening in the sector. Um, so common difficulties include replacement for poor coaching and teaching. So um, essentially what we've seen um, is that uh, looking to try and find an online solution because perhaps certain subjects or certain modules or certain elements have been poorly delivered by members of staff and so it's just like well let's go and get a an e-learning module or let's go and get this and we'll just supplement it with that and that doesn't necessarily uh, fix the issue um, it's got to be thought through a lot more carefully than that and no phased approach so there's no kind of planning or structure around how that online blended solution is going to be sort of part of the delivery models moving forward. It's almost as if, uh, you know, they look for a solution or they look for something that could help and they just implement it straight away. And staff are caught off guard, not quite sure about how to, you know, to, to work best with the solution. And so it's just, it just doesn't get off the ground. One size doesn't fit all. So just because you're using one particular model, uh, it could that particular model could work really well for a particular subject, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's then going to transfer over to another subject. You know, we can't ignore that certain subjects aren't going to necessarily just naturally fit into a blended approach. Um, and so we have to be really careful about how we utilize blended models and not just assume that because we've got one working somewhere in our organization that it will just automatically transfer across to another area. A little or no monitoring, especially in terms of quality. So um, no one's really taking responsibility for how it's being delivered or it's being looked at or the quality of the provision within it. And so it, it's, you know, learners are suffering because no one's really checking on are they actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and are they actually learning and making progress? <clears throat> there are elements, obviously, that sometimes can be cluttered and difficult to navigate. So um, if the online system that's being used or indeed the solution that's being sought for, um, the learners are finding it difficult to get what they need or find what they need to do, um, it's all a bit cluttered, then obviously that's going to affect their, their ability to sort of get on with their learning, really. And, and that obviously then has a, 
a negative effect. Save money on delivery and reduce staff numbers. That's one we've come across many, many times. So um, automatically it's kind of, well, you know, if we put a blended approach in and we put something more online, then we can reduce the number of staff who are delivering. Well, that might be the case in some subjects, but really a, a genuinely good blended approach using really effective online technology requires staff who are skilled in those areas. And so, you know, you've got to have staff who are comfortable, understand what is the technology is doing, understand the benefits of that technology and how it can help those learners. Um, and from there, then obviously everybody's going to move forward. But obviously, if it's just a case of, oh, we've got an online approach, um, uh, we've got some online solutions put in for this subject so we can reduce the amount of people on the ground, that's not necessarily going to help. That includes, and a really important one, a lack of skills and delivery staff, including a lack of training and support. So we saw this starkly highlighted during COVID, where we got numbers and numbers of phone calls from organisations who were struggling because of a, a system they'd taken on which they didn't really know how to utilize properly and so they were looking to come to us for, for a solution but that wasn't necessarily what they needed what they needed was understanding the technology that they had in their hands understanding how it could be used effectively and training their staff how to use it effectively because a lot of people a lot of staff assume or they're assumed to just know how to get on with stuff and that's not the case it's really important that staff feel part of the journey or a part of the the approach of learning solutions that you're looking to adopt. And so that training and support for staff is vital because then they can train and support the learners through the process too. High levels of self-motivation and self-learning skills required from the learners. So obviously there are some online solutions and online materials, which ultimately will just require, you know, those learners who can just get on with it, they just get on with it because they're already self-motivated to achieve, already self-motivated motivated to just get on and get on with achieving their qualification or their programme of learning. That's not necessarily the case, as we all know, for every learner. And so we need to look at how we can sort of bring those learners who are falling behind slightly with this, and how we can utilise effective solutions to do that. That was, would be where, where the analytics and the data comes in that we touched, about, touched on earlier. It's also high initial investment and not quick enough returns. So um, sometimes we can look for a solution, we can plan it really effectively and go, there we go, there's a lot of money we're going to put into this to ensure that we can get you know, really good learning outcomes for all our learners. But because of the things we mentioned earlier uh, in terms of common difficulties, um, the returns aren't quick enough. And so the, the, the backing of the idea or the backing of the project loses a little bit of that kind of momentum because they're not seeing it all not, you know, people in the leadership and management team or even higher in terms of the investors in the organisations aren't seeing the returns quick enough. And that that's not good because it's, it's, there's a lot more at stake here than just high emission investment. The wrong blend we've seen used quite a lot. So heavily weighted in one way or another, too much em emphasis on online or too much emphasis or vice versa in face to face. As we said also earlier, it's that ability to make sure that it, just because one particular blended model might work on one subject or one kind of thing doesn't necessarily mean it will automatically be the right blend for another one. So it's looking at how you know the best blend is in place for every program that you look at and delivery. It's easy to develop a bias for a particular technology or delivery method, especially when it's new or exciting. So um, we've seen some examples where um, projects have been run by people with you know really high IT skills and they can see obviously they can see the benefits of obviously putting technology in place to help support delivery staff or help you know, support teaching and learning um, elements but just because it's good for that person or they can see the benefits doesn't necessarily transfer across to other members of staff you have to get the full buy-in from everybody who's delivering to see the benefits and to make sure that it is the best method, best method for how they deliver and of course, require, well, this is hugely important. If there's no learning culture, it's not if, if technology or education technology or blended learning or the models around blended learning hasn't been embedded into the way that you as an organization learn and deliver, then it's never going to get off the ground. Okay. Providers can no longer ignore the impact of a blended approach. I've seen this through COVID. Um, and I've, it's paying me to see it. I've had phone calls from organizations who weren't our customers um, and they were crying out for help 
because they just didn't have a solution in place and they were looking to really fast track some kind of a solution and, and in some cases they've not survived um, just because they just weren't able to adapt in time but you know providers who decide against adopting a blended approach will struggle to survive in the fall. there's just no way around it you know um, delivery models are going to have to change and, and with that providers colleges are going to have to get on board so blended learning means more effective and more sustainable learning. This is especially true if the learners are accompanied by moderators, tutors, coaches, trainers who are comfortable with the tech being utilised. That is essential that staff are trained, understand the technology, are given time to go out and research other methods of technology that could enable their learners to move forward and help bring that into the organisations. It has to be all levels of staff are buying into this. So <clears throat> I don't know if I need to spend too much time on the benefits, but I'm going to because uh, just in case people are still a little bit unsure about the benefits, but benefits include learning anytime, everywhere. So technically there should be no reason why learners can't access learning on any device at any time, any stage to help them move forward with their programs. They can work through a specific task or problem as often as they want until they reach their learning goal, either online, face to face, or of course, uh, repeating tasks that they've been given by their tutors. It's proven to boost learner efficiency, autonomy and advocacy. Now, at the end of this presentation, I have a, a link to a number of different uh, research projects and research elements, which I'm happy to share. With anybody at the end of the uh, end of this or even give you access to this uh, presentation so you can have a look for yourselves but th th there's no question that the research shows that uh, when done correctly a blended approach does um, enable these skills to be to be uh, to be built upon better tracking of progress as i said before certainly with the analytics um, the ability to then be able to track progress be able to nail you know really hone in on areas which need addressing or need um, further learning outcomes associated to those areas. Um, certainly the blended approach now is, a, is producing much better returns on that. Enhances the provider input to the learner journey. So, um, you know, it allows uh, the delivery staff to have more input into what goes into the program, what goes into the curriculum, gives them more autonomy in terms of how to close the gap for certain learners. You can focus on deeper learning because you can track, obviously, um, learners in terms of what projects they've completed, but then seamlessly you can then um, stretch and challenge with further projects um, and, and, and dig, digging deeper into other resources which are available for your learners. Obviously, it allows for instant diagnostic information and learner feedback, so you can get those instantly from a blended approach. And it's preparing learners for the future now. Um, for better or for worse, technology is definitely going to be increasing and the um, you know, the money going into technology across the globe is going to increase. Um, and our learners are going to need to understand how to best prepare themselves for that. And that's why a blended approach, I think, is going to be vital uh, for all organisations. OK, so how can we incorporate blended learning successfully into our learning and delivery models? Well. Uh, quote here, uh, every student can learn, just not on the same day or the same way. Um, and that is very true. And so a blended approach, I, I genuinely believe, has to take that into consideration. Now, which delivery method will best help your learners reach their objectives? Part of choosing the most effective learning delivery methods is getting to grips with who your learners are. So after all, you can't select the best option without understanding who you're trying to help. We always say start with understanding exactly what people need to achieve, along with how close they are to reaching those goals. That's your starting point. Then provide resources which are accessible to all learners first, gear them towards specific and attainable goals. <clears throat> and then you look to stretch and challenge all the learners who are advancing quickly through your materials. Make sure your digital learning space is engaging and easy to use and keep everything in one place. Don't expect your learners to keep going from here to there to there to here. Uh, keep them in one place where everything is recorded and they can access everything. Think about what your learners need to do with the information after the course is finished and design around that. Um, 
you know, I'm, I, I appreciate in some cases I'm just preaching to the choir here. I already know all of this stuff, but it's amazing how many people we come across and how many organisations we come across that don't think about that. And so that's why I put that in there. Okay, so we've compiled a, a list, a quick list really, of, of learning technologies that we believe are necessary to secure outstanding learning delivery in today's world. This is not in order of importance. It's okay, we're not saying number one is the number one or number 15 is the number 15. And in fairness, this list is seemingly changing on a monthly basis at the moment. Uh, and it's hard to keep up with it all, but it's um, it's definitely ex an exciting space at the moment in terms of what's happening in the world and what technologies are coming out. Um, so first one on there is LMS VLE. So I think we all know that the best way to deliver track and report on your learning performance is with the use of a learning management system, uh, which should be a, re a repository for all of your learning. Now, an LMS and a VLE, a VLE aren't, aren't necessarily the same thing. So a virtual learning environment is a method of presenting resources to the learners, which encourages them to drive their own learning. So all virtual learning environments will have an LMS, but not all learning management systems have a virtual learning environment, okay? So it's really important that there is a distinction between the two. Next one is um, UX design and features or user experience design and features. So it's important to consider that learners will be using your learning management system and how easily will they be able to navigate and interact with your chosen solution. So it's really important that you've got something that's universally accessible, that has a modern interface, potentially replicates products that your learners are already using in their own time, but just something that they're familiar with so that it doesn't become something kind of an alien area which they just find difficult to get on and, and sort of learn or engage with the learning process. And next one, <clears throat> learning library. So all learning management systems will hold learning resources, but it's important to be aware of what resources are supported and the flexibility with which they can be catalogued. So generally speaking, more resource types will create a more interesting, engaging experience for your learners as well in, as well as allowing you to take advantage of content created by others. So it's really important that you have a learning library that is able to not just your organization to produce your own learning materials, but is actually able to integrate with lots of other solutions seamlessly so that learners feel they're in the same place, that they're not being sent from here to there to there, as I said earlier, but actually it's all accessible in, in one platform. Next one uh, is an authoring tool in terms of another top technology. So how do you procure your learning content? You know, is it pre-built? Is it bespoke? Is it self-built? So authoring tools allow you to create your own e-learning for use by your learners. And this can be particularly useful if you work within a niche field, uh, but ease of use can differ greatly depending on the specific authoring tool you're using. Preferably, you'll have an authoring tool built into your system so you can create e-learning and quizzes and and other elements uh, very quickly and seamlessly so your learners and your staff can produce and learn effectively in, in a very, relatively short space of time. <clears throat> Next one here, well, I don't need to spend too long with this one. I think most people <laughs> would appreciate that, you know, most educational providers, colleges right now, you know, you have to have an e-portfolio option. You all know there are tons out there. Um, you know, and good e-portfolios we know have to have a seamless sort of mapping area of the program that the learners are on and how they can map their work and how staff can map the work, you know, a place to reflect on their learning, or a, place, a place to record their progress, a place to um, uh, track, you know, the off the job and the flexibility to catalog learning. You know, we could go on and on about the benefits of a good e-portfolio, but it doesn't matter if this is this year or in five years time, you know, whatever technology comes out, it would still need a really up-to-date and modern and fresh e-portfolio to be able to sustain and still be able to carry the learners through their learning. Okay, next one. So individual learner record and ESFA reporting functionality. So again, you know, I think most of you here would already agree it's really important. This is essential, um, but it's a blended approach. And so this all should be, you know, digitized, it should be all uh, accessible online. Uh, it shouldn't really require paperwork anymore. It should all really be uh, an online digital form, all captured, uh, all be able to be sort of digitally analyzed and reported on. 
um, and that should all be built in. There shouldn't be any reason for you to have to go off into other systems. It should all be in one place. <clears throat> also, smart classrooms. Now, this is much more than just an average video-based lesson, such as a Zoom session or a team session, but it's the ability to add in varied resources, um, creating integrated and interactive learning experiences, such as micro-learning, which I'll touch on in a moment, and it should be integrated seamlessly. It should be able to be tracked. They should be able to be scheduled. They should be learners should be able to be told about when they're having this, these sessions. Uh, they should be on their learning files. It should be, so it should be, it should just be part of what you're doing. And and I think any blended approach right now has to have some kind of smart classroom integration built in. Video conferencing platform. I think we all know. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> certainly uh, things as we know like Zoom. Teams, Cisco, whatever you, whatever you're using, even you know we're using something called Hopin today. So you know, are you able to integrate these video conferencings into your solutions? You know, is it all in one place? Can it be in one place so that learners can access it without having to go off into other areas? Actually, it's all kept in one place and recorded. Peer-to-peer -peer discussion forums. So, can you host discussion forums? Can you have a chat functionality so that your learners can talk about certain topics and subjects whilst in their classroom environment online? Um, can that be recorded? Can it? Uh, can learners go back and read what they've done and what other learners have sort of given them as ideas as as their course progresses? This is, you know, a classic blended approach. Gamification. So. Um, Things like leaderboards, um, you know, awards, um, you know, a, a way of competency building. So ways that your learners can compete against each other potentially in terms of how they're completing certain subjects or certain modules, um, and a way just for to, just to showcase, you know, who's who's performing really well and who needs to do more. Um, you know, there's there's loads of different ways that gamification can be used now. Uh, now I must stress that. Gamification doesn't necessarily align itself with every learner. You know, I know a number of learners that don't really like gamification when it's used, but I also know a number of learners who love it. So again, it comes down to that one size doesn't fit all, ensuring that learners who want to be part of a kind of gamification area within your system can access it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every learner has to. <clears throat> Micro learning. Um, so this is essentially, um, HTML5 packages, which are individually, they're sort of like individual learning objects, which you're able to track and report on, but they're sort of, they're standalone resources, which you can sort of use really quickly um, to um, to sort of test and, and sort of uh, excite your learners. So, you know, interactive videos, question sets, hotspots, memory games, virtual 360 tours, created really quickly inside your learning management systems can then be transferred to your smart classroom environments or directly into a learner's file so they can complete an exercise to test for knowledge checks. So these kind of little micro learning objects now are really starting to take off. Uh, and it's something I'd re recommend all of you to sort of have a look at in more detail. We talked about it uh, briefly earlier, e-forms, digital forms. So, you, you know, we talk, you know, paper is going away. You, you know, we're not going to get away with being able to just have um, standardized paperwork that, you know, you, you go to your learner and go to the managers and things like that and get them physically signed. They <clears throat> really now, you should really be expected to have these things online uh, and, a, and a seamless way of being able to bring your forms and digital forms directly to your learners, directly to the employers and have everything all put built into one place. Another thing that's going to be really important about your blended approach will be a CPD tracker. We've talked the importance we've talked about in terms of getting staff updated with knowledge and skills to be able to deliver technology or to deliver the solutions you're looking for. Have a CPD tracker built into your system, which allows you to deliver training to your staff um, and track their competencies um, accordingly. And then you know that your staff are skilled up because they've done the learning or they've done the training and you've tracked and measured it. Curriculum building planning tools. So, you know, does your solution have curriculum building and planning tools so you can control how resources are structured within the modules in your programs? And it also helps you control when those resources are visible to the learners. Um, so you can schedule and timetable things to come in and go as you need them to. So this helps with navigation, understanding of course administration. 
And finally here, integrations and interoperability. So systems need to be able to talk to each other. Any blended approach you put together, you have to understand your vendor's approach to integrations and the compatibility with other standards that they're working with. So it's really now important that you don't just take a system that's closed off to other solutions. The best thing that you can do for yourselves to minimize risk going forward is to have a solution which allows you to build build on that solution with other solutions and keeping it in one place rather than as i said before having to go here there and everywhere or indeed your learners having to go here there and everywhere here are just some examples of integrations that should seamlessly be part of any of your your, your solutions that you've got this should be a no-brainer some of these things um, if you need any discussions any of this you just contact me other considerations for the future, um, I think we do really need to touch on this um, because this is this is going to be big over the next few years, as, as no doubt a lot of you are aware. So artificial intelligence, so automated assignment grading, chatbots as tutors, instant language translations, learning personalization, robotic process automation. Um, all of these things are already being used in other sectors right now. And I would suggest that further education will start, we'll start seeing this very, very, very soon um, in terms of how we best utilize the, art, the, the AI capabilities now across these sectors. Um, this is gonna be huge and something which uh, we'll need to keep an eye on as a sector <laughs> and start to really utilize effectively in how we deliver and how we can organizations processes moving forward. 5G, so uh, with the ongoing rapid co coverage expansion, um, the 5G network will help in driving mass adoption of remote learning and intelligent training programs. That's part of what the government's uh, rollout of 5G, 5G was all about. You know, that's, you know, that's what they've been talking about. So their argument is through its steady speed, it will provide consistent access to online educational material, live courses efficiently and thus enhance the remote learning experience for unit users. So I suppose their argument is if they can roll out 5G up and down the country, that every learner in a, in a sense has access to some kind of 5G network, then essentially what they're saying is that you can really run online learning anytime, anywhere, and no learner should be left behind. Obviously, there's quite a long way to go until that's achieved, but that's the stated objective. And virtual reality, while the initial case for VR was the entertainment industry, um, it has relevance in education and tra training, and I think will play a really big role in providing quality education and improving understanding-based learning among certain students on certain subjects. Maybe not every subject. I don't believe for a moment that every subject that you that's currently being run in apprenticeships requires virtual reality but I think it definitely adds value to certain ones. Um, you know, virtual tours of the human body, so for nursing, uh, possibly, you know, and doctors, you know, possibility of interacting with models and moving with different layers of the body or, or even, uh, you know, within the sort of um, engineering um, and construction subjects, you know, some of the virtual reality stuff that can be done there is it's just amazing. And so I think we're gonna see more and more of this really uh, over the next few years. Okay, um, so as I said, I'll be sharing this with you at, um, if you want to, I'll be able to share this particular um, presentation with, with you. And here are the details here for myself. So, you know, happy to discuss this in a sort of very informal way. Um, my email address is here, my phone number is here. You can visit us uh, at uh, Open Elms, uh, the Open Elms stand uh, where I'll be uh, today and tomorrow. So feel free to come along and speak to me. Oh, you know, well, obviously just send me a message if you want to. Um, well, uh, here are the sort of products that we're running and the kind of services we provide. And as I said, uh, there's links to the reading in other areas of where um, we've got some of this research sorted. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Um, so if there are any questions or if you need anything, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you all um, very soon. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye now.